Welcome aboard! It is time for us to rock and or roll as we enter- No, 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 you're not having deja vu. This is not about a blue robot. Though there's still plenty of metal to go around. This is Music Arcade! Hello everyone, welcome to Music Arcade. We're going to be talking about some rock today. Joining me as well, always are my dear friends. The name of the of the theme given was track that just absolutely shred. Indeed. Uh, though, though, again, uh, no actual reference to Shredder from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which was disappointing, I did take him into consideration immediately, but have decided that other tracks, such as the ones we are talking about, Shred objectively more. Yeah, sadly, no music from Turtles in Time in this episode, despite it having a very good soundtrack. We will get to it. Yes. I'd like to note that Ronakel has been waiting to make that joke for a month now. Yep. Uh, we are happy to welcome Eddie back after he got hailed out last time. We had to scramble, haha, for a Persona Re 5 episode. Reports of yeah, my that death was a bit of a Hail Mary. Yeah, reports of my death have been greatly ex exaggerated. Your internet's death, on the other hand, were not greatly exaggerated. That thing died horribly. Oh, yeah. It does not like hail or hey. thunder. Un understandable. Lightning. Disappointing, but understandable. Anyway. Cleanup was a mess as well, but let's go away from water and into metal, shall we? Well, first, why don't you two introduce yourselves, because we kind of skip past that part. No, I guess I'm on a Kelvin. I suppose you just heard my name, but I am Eddie, and I shall continue to be Eddie, and I have no proper intro still. Okay. <laughs> and I'm Galen, the sound guy, Firestone. Welcome to Music Arcade. Let's go ahead and dive right into the very, very loud and guitar-heavy nonsense. Eddie, you're first up. Yeah, and I'm about to talk about a franchise known for shredding and a composer known for shredding, and that is Daisuke Shuatari from uh, Guilty Gear fame. But the franchise is actually Dragon Ball, and if you think Dragon Ball doesn't shred, you might not be, be remembering their old PS2 games. But we are talking about Dragon Ball Fighters this time, and it's pretty much universal in Dragon Ball Fighters that the villains have the best songs. Wait, Fighters or Fighter Z? Uh, we'll pronounce it Fighters. Because that uppercase Z is dumb. Oh, okay, uh, we are talking about Fighter Z. The actual proper name is Fighter Z. Yeah, uh, it's I, just... There's like 86... It's there's like 86,000... Yeah, no, I got it. There's like 86,000 Dragon Ball games. It's hard for me to keep track of which one's which. I didn't know if Fighters and Fighter Z were two different games. It's entirely possible. Yeah, no, I don't think there is one just Fighters, but yeah, it's an Arxis title, so people just pronounce it however. Pretty much. I mean, Guilty Gear X, X, X and Core is a thing, but anyway. Back to Dragon Ball Fighters. Uh, I picked up a thing for a character that has multiple variations in the game, and that is Broly, which, strangely enough, he's not one of the characters with the most variations, despite him being the one character with a canon and a non-canon versions. Go figure. And his tracks really shred. One of them, for the original Broly, which I should note wasn't originally in my plans to talk about, but Ranaka ended up sharing it so it's so me under pretty... the bus why don't you <laughs> okay i can't really blame him for going oh here's broly's theme and you can throw a completely different broly's theme and they're two different songs for two different characters i'm both pretty named sure broly. he was the one that gave me this broly's theme <laughs> i don't recall that but anyway <laughs> broly also OG i like this one better og broly as they call him uh I the non canon think? one. What was that? Uh, the non canon one. I think he was only in a movie. Uh, three movies because they milked the hell out of him. <laughs> okay. Sure. That's. Uh, but. That's on brand for yeah. Dragon Ball, let's be honest there. 
he's basically Dragon Ball Sephiroth. Uh, but yeah, he he was the original Broly. Uh, the new Broly was uh, his was released in a movie that came after Dragon Ball Fighters was released. So no one thought he would be added to the game. So this Broly was the one that would be it. We thought at the time, and his theme is pretty cool, pretty awesome. The guitars really shred, and uh, I think he might. This might be the one theme in our playlist today that has actually some sort of growled vocals, which is uh, a big thing that metal is known for. Yeah, when I listened to the song, I was kind of surprised those growled vocals were not sung by Mark Jansen. <laughs> this sounds yeah. like Epica to me. Compositionally, totally, this sounds like Epica. The only thing it's missing is the Middle Eastern influence. I was expecting Simone to come in at any point. <laughs> now, what I really like about this film is that it's part of a package. You have Broly, and I, full disclosure, I haven't seen the material he's, he's coming from, but I see this ultra roided out character even for Dragon Ball standards and his play style appears to be full 200% Unga McBungas and then you have the track which is absolutely in the same vein and it just provides an entire cohesive aesthetic package of Unga of and Unga much. yes uh, it's Unga all the way down, and I really like the cohesiveness in that. You see this guy, and yeah, sure, his track goes rah, 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 like that. It just makes sense to me. Well, the other broadest theme seems to at least pretend to be civilized at times. I think that also speaks to the different characters, because the original Broly was this two-dimensional character who's just evil because they needed a, needed a villain. Uh, he's oh, those are my favorite kinds. Motivation. What was that? Oh, those are my favorite kinds. Uh, uh, you wouldn't like him because his original motivation was that as a baby he was... Sarcasm, dude. Did you learn it? Time. Huh? I was being sarcastic. But... Uh, his motivation was that as a baby he spent too much time beside Goku and Goku cried too much <laughs> and then he hates Goku because of that <laughs> oh my god he's, li he's literally the strongest man child in anime oh my god okay uh, so then came the new Broly a couple years back which is the Dragon Ball Super Broly which is the other thing that we are talking about and this character actually has characterization. He actually is a person. And to the point where during the fight, you see he's about to die and you don't know if you should uh, go, Broly shouldn't die here, he's innocent. Or if you should go, yes, they should kill Broly because he's destroying the planet. And you're, it, it creates a really interesting dynamic that you don't often see in Dragon Ball, because Dragon Ball tends to be rather two-dimensional with its villains. And Broly is actually very interesting. You don't know who to root for, this new version of Broly. It turned out really, really well uh, well written. And I think the song kind of shows the, honestly the change. The most, uh, oh, no, go ahead. I think the song uh, that is used as his theme for the new game kind of shows the change. Or when he transforms into his uh, green-haired uh, legendary Super Saiyan uh, version because he goes from this mild-mannered guy who's been told his entire life to hate Vegeta into a completely berserker type character without anything in mind other than I must kill and it's entirely not part of his personality he's just out of control he, his body is out of control and I think the the track shows that because it goes from this kind of pretty orchestral bit into just shredding guitars. Yeah, except the shredding part is ninety percent of the track. Yeah, because and that's what Broly does. 
Yeah. You make it sound like his ratio in the source material is kind of reverse where he's only in full buzzer kunkama bunga mode 10% of the time. That's 100% true for the other Broly. This Broly, not so much, but I think they had to do it this way because it's a fighting game. I don't know. Plus, it's it's Arxis. Guitars are their thing. Yeah. I said it in passing, but I think it's important to take a note of one thing that's important for our theme as a whole, which is that shredding kind of makes sense and goes hand to hand with the natural pace fighting game it has. It's probably one of the quickest, fastest pace uh, common ground uh, genre around and it just works kind of naturally. I think it works particularly well for this genre that uh, I'm not sure the proper name most people I've heard seem to refer to it as a uh, anime fighter which are games like uh, Guilty Gear, Dragon Ball, uh, Marvel vs Capcom where you have these high jumps, these dashes, you have ways to just clear the screen, you have projectiles all around and it really fits that very high paced uh, fighting style that these games have as a very to a more noisy yeah, and uh, Dragon Ball Fighters is a three-on-three -three game, so you also have your assists. So it's not a Mortal Kombat, it's not a Tekken, it's much fast, faster paced. And even the good guys in the game do have some fast paced tracks, but it's just universal among people who play Dragon Ball Fighters that... So you think good guys track. shouldn't have fast paced tracks, do you? I'm not saying they shouldn't, I'm saying they generally seem to not have as fast-paced tracks in this game as the other characters. I mean, I'm looking at our list of songs for this, and we did kind of stick with villains and or bosses for the most part, to be perfectly honest. Well, bosses in particular make sense because antagonism uh, breeds conflict and conflict and metal also work together well. Yes. Yes, they do. Also, for the record, I think when Galen mentioned the Epica thing, he was talking about the Dragon Ball uh, Super version of Broly, which is the one with the orchestral bit at the start. I was talking about the one you posted in Music Arcade. I can't tell the difference yeah, between the two. That's the orchestral one. That's the, the Dragon Ball Super. The, ah. uh, the one with the growls is the other version. Got it. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I, I see your comparison with Epica. I, I don't have anything, I guess, against it. I just... Uh, Epica is just not a band I'm very much into because it turned out a bit formulaic and I don't like how they tend to record Simone Simon's voice. Uh, she was amazing on the last... Uh, um, on the latest Arian album. But in Epic albums, I am not really a fan of her voice, of how they record it. It lacks a bit of oomph to it. That's kind so of how I... I don't necessarily agree, but that's kind of how I feel about Elise Rid of Amaranth. I swear I like her on everything she does except her own actual band's work. I don't like Amaranth, so I... Probably Neither do I. I just... The same boat. Yeah. But anyway, I, I think that's enough talking about metal bands that haven't done game soundtracks, so... Galen, you're next. So, there's this mobile game I play called Dark Knights. And it is a Hong Kong and Shanghai developed uh, mobile game with... Uh, they're a really global endeavor. Uh, their illustrators are in New York. Uh, sorry, their, their PV illustrators are in New York. Their voice cast is entirely Japanese. Um, it's a very interesting sort of thing. Uh, one thing they do, they don't have an in-house composer. They do commissioned, uh, compositions. So this has actually gotten them into trouble once or twice. Uh, one of their contingency contracts actually 
ended up getting them into plagiarism trouble because they didn't do enough research about their uh, the composer they hired at the time who apparently was actually trying to deliberately sabotage them. And it almost kind of worked. There's a whole story about this that I would love to get into at some point. Oof. Yeah. Um, there's a whole story about this I'd love to get to at some point. We're not going to be talking I about like that how, right now. I like how the first two franchises we're talking about are franchises where we could do episodes on their legal troubles about uh, <laughs> the soundtracks. We probably could. Because Dragon Ball has a lot of that, too. I'm sure. Um, anyway, uh... Like mo most mobile games, it has periodic events, and my least favorite event thus far is an event called Code of Brawl, all about, honestly, one of my favorite little subdivision factions in Arknights, Penguin Logistics. Um, this event was bad. Like, the story of this event was so convoluted, unnecessary, and just made me bang my head up against a wall, in that it accomplished absolutely nothing. <laughs> like, at the end of the story... Nothing changed at all, and everything was right back where it was, and I'm like, what was the point of any of this? We nah, didn't yes, even... Yeah, Simpson episode. Yeah, it pretty much... Honestly, that's the best comparison I've heard about this all day. Um, That's like the Dragon Ball episode where Piccolo and Goku learn how to drive. Which is a real thing. Yeah, I... Okay, you just derailed my brain there, so I'm going to just ignore the fact that you said that and move on with talking about Arknight so we can stop talking about Dragon Ball. Um, the one thing I did like about this event, that I really liked about this event, was the music, especially the final boss theme, King Mouse. Um, this song kind of blew me away when it first hit. Because it will just... It goes hard right from the beginning and does not stop. Like, you get this opening riff that just goes, and then it just layers instrument after instrument after instrument on you. It is one of the most tense and just foreboding songs in the whole game. You know you are up against a monster. And at the time, King, at the time, the Rat King, the boss in question, was actually the single most complicated boss that you played against. He's been eclipsed since then, but at the time, he definitely had the most mechanics going on and most things happening at once. And it was... Very interesting. What I find interesting is that, especially in contrast to the previous uh, track, which goes ham all the way and goes very fast-paced and kind of chaotic, uh, this one, given that it's a track for a different kind of game with a very different pace, shreds, but in a much more deliberate and constructed way. I mean, that's in character. The Rat King is actually a very cunning mob boss, or triad boss would probably be the most accurate statement under the circumstances. Um, and his actions were always very deliberate and constrained, despite being brutal. So that's that's on brand for him, to be perfectly honest. That, that actually fits him very well. Which is another reason I really like this song, because it fits the boss fight. It isn't just sort of out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, this is one of the few tracks from Arknights that really wowed me just on first listen. And Arknights has a really good soundtrack as a whole. Like, I've been very impressed with the music pretty much throughout. But this one really just got me immediately, got stuck in my head and wouldn't leave. And every time I listen to it, I feel like I discover something new about it, which is, which is nice. Some new way the guitar line works, some new layer to the instrumentation... Again, this originally came out of my phone's speakers. Like, it says a lot they're putting that much work into it. It's pretty weird that a song so involved and with so many elements to it is kind of relegated to devices not exactly known for having good sound cards. Where even if you plug in a good set of uh, headphones, you won't get 100% of the song. You have to open it up on an emulator or on, on your browser to get the full experience. Uh, and I have joked a lot of times before about how this this is a game that sounds much better than it deserves to. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it sounds better than it deserves to necessarily, but it definitely sounds better than you'd expect. Um, there's this thought in comic books, writing for the trades, which is to say... 
In comics, you're writing for the trade paperback as opposed to individual issues. I feel like there's a similar a similar situation with the soundtrack. You're you're not writing for the game. You're writing to sell the soundtrack CD down the road. Which makes it surprising that it fits so well, then, if that's the process. I don't know if it's the process. That's just what I assume the process to be. I'm I'm guessing here. I don't know. This one this one hit me real hard. Um I really love the lead guitar line that drives it. Uh, very rarely does a lead guitar take this much melodic, uh, just take this much melody focus. Um, something about it and the way just the tone dials in, it just feels good, right? It feels like... It's hard for me to describe. I honestly kind of fell, fell in love with the orchestration. Yeah, uh, it's not very common for you to hear uh, a metal track, even in an actual album, that has a full orchestration and uses uh, the horns of the orchestra in the middle of the track as part of the melody. Usually, it's just a bombastic bit at the intro or a bombastic bit to send off the track at the end. If you hear horns in an uh, a symphonic metal track. This one actually has them adding a bit more uh, harmony on top of the main melody, and it works really, really well. Yeah, um, I, I think the trick with that, and this is kind of pulling back the curtain, most horn samples on synthesizer are really not good. Like, it is hard, 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 hard to get a good horn sound out of a synthesizer, so a lot of composers just don't do it that often for that exact reason, but if you can pull it off, it can sound really good, as as you just described. Pull it off, they did. Yes, indeed. There's a joke here about pulling the main character off of Kuze to lead into the next song, but I have no idea how to make it, so I'll leave that to you punsters to figure out, and uh, yeah, let's talk about the next song. Well, I'm not even going to start with a pun. I'm going to start it instead with something insightful for once. Oh, okay. About how, about how the three opening tracks, the one we've uh, talked so far on this one, are essentially shredding tracks that are also character pieces that reflect the different hues of brutality of their own character. And that certainly applies to Daisaku Kuze from Yakuza Zero. This track, Pledge of Demon, I mean... Even though the main core of the track is very solid, the opener does a lot of the heavy lifting. You just see him and it's go da na 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 da na 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 And yeah, you know you don't have a chump in front of you. And there's the fact that it's so front loaded also kind of reflects on the way the character operates. Yeah. Uh, even when he is deceiving you and uh, using trickery to get to you, it's not to throw a hundred uh, of people under his command to jump on you. It's to go one-on-one -on -one with you, him, and a steel pipe. And a bike. But the bike is only in the intro. Sadly. Um, it would have been very yeah. interesting to fight a guy on a motorcycle in that game, got to be honest. Awesome. Yeah. But the battle system obviously isn't made for that. I mean, you say that, but there was that whole, like, time crisis slash Virtua Cop chase scene later in the game of that, so yeah, they could have made that also work. also is a pretty solid track, too. Agreed, but that's not the one we're talking about. Anyway, yeah. um... I would also Kuze. like to say that, in terms of Kuze, his importance as a boss actually is also very front-loaded, because when you first fight the guy... Yeah, he's the most important thing in the room, but by the end, the last time you fight him, he's kind of just one more obstacle. Yeah, and um, not only one more obstacle, he's also he also grows less and less antagonistic. The more you fight him, the more you understand him. So yeah, I think that just... Uh... The, the shredding again reflects how ultimately his fighting style is very uh, heavy, heavy punches that just 
knock you out, uh, seal pipes, uh, the subtle tools of the trade from uh, uh, Captain of the Tojo Clan. Yeah. The uh... song is very... Uh, I haven't played Yakuza yet, uh, any of the games, sadly. Uh, because they've only been released on PC recently, and my PC is old and aging and can barely run half of them. But uh, listen to the track, it's very bass heavy, and I think it really fits what you guys are talking about. His, uh, his combat being, being very impactful and uh, him being a strong character. Because usually when you have uh, a lot of bass, it kind of adds a sense of impact to you. Uh, it's commonly uh, in cinemas, you you feel the bass more in your body than you hear it mm -hmm, uh, exactly. when you have sound effects. Uh, and in music, I think it also applies. Uh, the bass is, uh, is a, an instrument that people joke a lot about in particular because you... Like, it's not as glamorous as the guitar, you don't hear it very, very much. But in, in this track, uh, not necessarily the bass itself, the instrument, but the guitars in general are very uh, lowered, let's say. And it really gives, at least to me, a sense of impact to the, the riff. Yeah, and uh, I know from other tracks of the same series that they know how to play with the bass. They know how to make use of it, and they even know uh, how to make use of the complete lack of it in one track in particular that's designed to give a uh, uh, VHS uh, Kung Fu Bagan Bin um, film uh, uh, to it. Uh, yeah, no, they, they know their trade, and it, the bass is there for a reason indeed. Now then, shall we move on to uh, something less character-focused and more about a series as a whole? Well, you, you say that, but it's still going to be fairly character-focused because there's two characters... All right, anyway. Uh, yes, yes, we shall. So, um, I'm a big Dynasty Warriors fan. I have been for decades now, which is a real weird thing to say. God, I'm old. Yeah. Started um, with three. I started with two. I first played Dynasty Warriors 2 at a demo kiosk at Sam Goody's at Universal City Walk in, in Universal City, California. That should tell you just I how long ago this free, was. Along with a friend at his house, and the, there were the French dubs, and they were a thing. Oh, I'm sure. I the just, dub, the dubs of this game tend to, to usually be a thing. The entirety of the our... Sun Clan has a southern accent. <laughs> a French southern accent. I just want to point out to our listeners, if you're expecting the uh, traditional uh, one-two punch of comedy where it keeps getting more extreme, like I started with three, I started with two, and you were hoping I was going to say I started with the first one, here's the catch, I haven't played this franchise at all. Also, the first one was a fighting game. and I It was. It. Uh, fun fact, Dynasty Warriors 2 is actually Shin Sengoku Muso 1 in Japan. It was Which not... is why they yeah. keep having uh, numbers different. Yep. And then they did it again with Warriors Orochi, where For or literally was no reason. 1.5. Yeah. It's so, Final Fantasy 6 all over again. Uh, no, it's way stupider than that one. I understand what yes. happened with FF6. This one just makes less sense. This one, they stapled a series title onto two unrelated games, and it stuck. Um, that's like calling Nobunaga's Ambition for, like, Romance of the Three Kingdoms 14 or something. Like, it doesn't work. Yeah, or like calling uh, a strategy game set in the Three Kingdoms era Kesson. Like, Kesson 2. Yep. Although, in that case, that was still the same franchise, but this is getting... It's still dumb. Agreed. Command and conquer China. I, 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 I guess the, uh... I, I guess the, um... Moral of the story is Koei Tecmo is terrible at naming conventions and franchise naming. Uh, 
Agreed. They are not terrible at music, however. Uh, Sorry, one of I can't the... hear you of us. You're Samurai oh Warriors 4-2. <laughs> um, one thing they're not terrible at, however, is music. Uh, the soundtracks of the Dynasty Warriors games have pretty much been universally awesome. Even Dynasty Warriors 6, which is kind of the redheaded stepchild of the series, at least until 9 happened, I suppose, um, yes. has a pretty great soundtrack. Shout out to the redheads in the audience. Anyway, um, the, uh, the songs I'm going to talk about in particular, however, is in Dynasty Warrior 7, they, they actually started, uh, experimenting with kingdom motif. So each kingdom has its own theme. Um, so for the opening song, you would have Crush Em All, which is this you know, pulse-pounding, melody-driven, guitar-driven, you know. Pretty standard but good Dynasty Warriors track written by Dynasty Warriors mainstay composer Masa. Um, as far as I know, that's the only name he goes by, M-A-S-A, -A, all capitals. Uh, he's still their sound director, though. He stepped back from composing in recent titles. Crush Em All was probably the last really big piece that he did. Um, what's interesting is that also that particular melody line actually doubles as the motif for the new Kingdom of Jin. So when you get to the appropriately named The Last Battle, it's reprising that theme in a completely different context. It actually sounds really good. I love when something is echoing like that. I, I, I like that too, and I'm actually kind of surprised it took... Um, Dynasty Warriors that long to start experimenting with this considering uh, their whole franchise is essentially an echo of itself over and over again. Yeah, it seems that so. Uh, before that, most of the tracks were mostly fought as on a map-per-map -map basis. Yes. With the occasional character theme like Lubos, of course. Yes. Um, and that's still mostly the case. Uh, but once they started actually working with kingdom themes, like, in Dynasty Warriors 8, that expanded, so now instead of something like Crush Em All, each kingdom has their own opening music in their opening stage, and they have their own universal theme. Uh, and even to the point where Capricious Wind, the theme for, uh, Cherby, or the Battle of Red Cliffs, or whatever you want to call it, actually incorporates all three of the original three kingdoms, like, everything but Jin, all three of those leap motifs, into the one song. Um, because that's the first time the three of them clash at the same time. Correct. And uh, the new primary composer, Masato Koike, who I actually really like, this guy's work has been nothing but fantastic. Uh, he started, I believe, in 7 and has been doing incredible work ever since. Um, he, he, I think he figured that out. Um, yeah, I... I find myself very impressed with the use of motif in this regard, especially considering the difference between the starter, Crush Em All, which is just this borderline happy-go-lucky rock song, which, hey, you're starting your adventure. This is fun. And <laughs> Happy-go-lucky Crush Em All. I know, I know. I mean, it's a Dynasty Warriors game. That's kind of what we yeah, do. Yeah, Crushing Them All is kind of yet where yeah, what yeah. you do. It, it is, it's the game in a nutshell, let's be honest. Yes. Uh... At which point, I like, the, I like the idea of a happy-go-lucky song playing as you murder hundreds of people. Well, the thing is, you don't actually murder any of them because it's not kills; it's knockouts. Exactly, you're hitting them with non-lethal swords, or ambiguously lethal swords, or you know, in the case of a couple of people, non-lethal cannons. Yes, all balls on chains, etc. Yeah. A lot of fancy hit weapons. And a cannonball hits me and I just fall asleep. Yep, pretty oh, much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, Dynasty Warriors is a deeply silly franchise, but I do love it. I do. Um, partly because it's deeply silly. Partly because it's deeply silly, yeah. You know what? You're not wrong. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Just once Dynasty Warriors started playing with Motif, and I gotta be honest, I don't actually know if this continues into 9. 9 was such a weird, weird, weird game that I just couldn't do it for very long. Um, yeah. so I don't know if these musical themes continue into it, but for 
Dynasty Warriors 7 and 8 in particular, the use of these themes really worked. Um, and you would hear them over the overworld screen, you'd hear them... It, 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 it clicked a lot better than I thought it really had much of a right to, which is, you know, it's, it's good. I like it when games like that grow in that the regard. The way you describe it, it kind of reminds me of how... In FF14, each expansion has a main theme that you hear like dozens of variations of throughout the game. Yes, yes, actually, yeah, very similarly. That's not a that's not a bad comparison at all. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as Dynasty Warriors in general, I think that the rocking soundtrack, the shred, is basically part of the DNA on purpose from the start. Uh, the founding of the team that made the Dynasty Warriors Splinter series, uh, I learned that from an interview uh, in an episode of Game Center CX. Uh, basically, they went with uh, Omega Force and with this very new concept of high action, loosely uh, related historical figures to make people actually want to learn about the Three Kingdoms era, because originally uh, Koi is mostly history nerds making history nerd games. And then they decide to try to make something fun and impactful and with high action, and it essentially took over most of their business. They still make the Romance of the Three Kingdoms uh, more historically focused games, but uh, yeah, the working soundtrack is part of what makes a Dynasty Warriors game a Dynasty Warriors game. I would com purpose. completely agree with that. In fact, uh, there was one song I want to say in six or five that was like fully orchestral. It just felt wrong. It just felt wrong. And, and the most impressive part of it is probably that they made other series and gave each of them their own identity with uh, Warriors of Orochi having this fusion of styles and Samurai Warriors being much more theme-driven. Yep. No, it's 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 all very, very cool how they put it together. Um, which makes me kind of want to... Yeah, which makes me kind of want to shout it out because a lot of... Dynasty Warriors gets a lot of... Uh, gets a lot of... Um, Grief from non-fans for being, like... The same things every time. Yeah, and I I don't... I see that, but at the same time, like... I was going to say simplistic, actually. They get a lot of grief for being that's simplistic, amazing. and I don't think that's the case. It can be, but... There's a lot of work and a lot of love that goes into these games. And you can see that. Absolutely. Essentially, a lot of this series exists to make ancient Chinese historical figures more sexy. Well, in terms of a couple cases, it definitely seemed to work. Oh, yes. We could go literal in this case, I suppose. We could, but I'd rather not dive into NSFW on this show necessarily. Let's go ahead and move on to the next tong before we get all weird. Symphony of the Light, baby! Okay, now we're talking my language. <laughs> Yeah, m mine too, because I was just dozing off, because I don't know anything about Dynasty Warriors. But anyway, uh, if this episode were an actual metal album, uh, this would be the ballad in the middle of it. Because I think this is the slowest track we have on... on it is, but qualifying uh, it as a ballad doesn't work. This is a good solid mid-tempo. Uh, it is. I'm just saying by comparison i mean we, ha we had growls on our first track today <laughs> but anyway uh it's uh, Actually, the tragic think the, the pace is pretty similar to king mouse yeah i think it's a bit it, it gets there but, but it, it starts, starts slower. slower yeah it's uh it's tr the tragic prince it's the thing that plays in I, what I think everyone can agree is one of the hardest areas in every Castlevania game, the clock tower. And from the name of the track, I think it's easy to imagine that it's pretty much Alucard's theme. Uh, he is the tragic prince. And I think the track is really good at uh, 
playing with who he is because there's this melancholy at the start with the orchestral bit and then it goes into some hard rock heavy metal guitars that shows there's an edge to this guy because uh, to those who have played Castlevania or have at least uh, watched the Netflix show you probably have noticed that Alucard doesn't really care about humans all that much. He does it because he promised to his mother. Uh, right. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't be fighting. So he's. I like to think that he cares in absentia. Yeah, he cares in indirectly. He cares because his mother, uh, his mother cared. So uh, he feels it's important to him. And I that suppose. his show of care is to not meddle, more like. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, he's also constantly hating himself for having Dracula's blood in his veins. So there's that melancholy part. And I I pretty much put this up as a topic of conversation because I like to dive into gothic aesthetics a little bit. Because this track, I think it's fair to say that it has some strong gothic aesthetics to it, despite it not being neither gothic metal nor gothic rock and that's a change that has been happening a lot with gothic music in general uh, recently uh, not just in games we have a lot of gothic electronic things uh, popping up and gothic country is a genre uh, nowadays as well uh, Chelsea Wolf is a character uh, uh, a person who uh, she sings and plays guitar I think uh, I don't know if she plays any other instrument, but uh, her, her, her material tends to be very folky or very electronic and no one listens to her stuff and says that's not gothic. Uh, and I think this, this track, I wouldn't be bold enough to say that it started this movement. So I think it reflects that idea uh, because it's not a what you would look for if you were to look for a gothic metal track much less a gothic rock track which is way much mellow than this but it's still gothic you still listen to it and it evokes gothic imagery at least it does to me i mean i can see the project part especially in the downward trend of the main uh, motif the da, 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 which goes pretty deep and shows uh, yeah the the dourness uh, of Alucard but it is maybe a bit strong to call it a character film mostly based on this part and the track's name it is the clock tower theme, uh, yeah. first and foremost to me, and that's part of why it's even in this episode in the first place, because uh, Symphony of the Night isn't really a game that is prone to shredding, but this track has a part in it, barely perhaps, uh, but mostly because of... Uh, the fact that the clock tower, for the time the events of this game happen, is a highly technologically advanced uh, uh, contraption, and that this is translated by bringing electric guitars to another one of this classic track. I'm not sure it's... I agree with that take. Um, not that it's it, it's weird, but like the very opening track was the Rondo of Blood one with all those guitars, so. Mm, yeah, Dracula's Castle also has guitars. Yeah, they are much slower, but they also have. It also has guitars. Yeah, I, I would say. Yeah. I can understand the point because this one does go much uh, in, more in depth with the, and the why guitars. Why are and... they here? What was that? Then why are they here specifically? Because that's where it sounds cool. I think it's mostly because it's probably the song uh, from Out of Sodom that is the most fast-paced in the soundtrack, other than boss fights, 
maybe. Uh, and the clock tower is very hectic. There's a lot of stuff on the screen all the time. Uh, there's a lot of enemies. There's the Medusa heads constantly spawn. I that. Uh, but I would say that it also fits as a character uh, um, theme, not not if you just take the guitar, the rock me or metal part. I think it's mostly the contrast between the mellow uh, orchestral intro to the song to then drop into all these uh, rock and metal, uh, these rock and metal elements. I think that contrast is what makes this the tragic prince, uh, in my mind at least. And it's that contrast that creates a, a strong image in my head when I listen to this track. I believe in general play uh, the intended I order for the game. Uh, you actually come to the clock tower from the east where you are traveling through crumbling, uh, yeah, crumbling from bridge. The castle walls, so that area, I think. Yeah. That area is very dark, uh, and then you enter the tower, which is much brighter and has a lot of enemies inside. And I think the song also reflects that because it starts slow and dark, and go then goes into what's essentially just a guitar solo that doesn't stop. You'll forgive me for not really bouncing off the gothic aspect of the discussion. Yeah. Because my knowledge of gothic music isn't really all that deep. It pretty much starts uh, at knowing what Suxi is and stops at uh, a couple of tracks from Miranda Sex Garden, which are very much on the opposite end of the spectrum as far as space goes. I mean, if, if I cover a specific niche in this team, I am the gothic guy, let's be honest here. Yeah, closest I've got is uh, this one, Kane with a dragon head, uh, that started and ended my gothic phase when I realized that I couldn't really pull it off nor afford it. <laughs> So moving right along from that image, it's your pick next anyway, Rana. So go oh, ahead. Yeah, Just, uh, undersell economic issues, why don't you? Anyway, Thunder Force 4, it's a game that I never played. Me neither. Glad we're all on the same page this time. But I know I don't remember how I found this track, but I sure found this track. Um, yeah, it's red. It reads hard. It, the first part, it's just showing off. It doesn't even really have that much to do with the main theme. It's a remix of. Uh, but it's just good guitar and nothing but good guitar as far as I'm concerned. And then it goes into the main theme. Uh, it's funny to hear the original comparison because oddly the the taint of the guitar is, seems pretty deliberate to match the Genesis slash Mega Drive uh, sound set and uh, the very particular kind of sound it emits, which here is translated by this very heavy guitar that goes uh, for this high pace, high octane uh, uh, track uh, that is apparently for a uh, uh, shoot em up. Um, yeah, I, I was about to ask, it's one of those. Uh bullet hell games or just okay no stop not all flying shoot them up no. are bullet games do not conflate the, su the genre with the subgenre I will choke you <laughs> I know they are wow. not, not the same thing I was just asking if it was one of those yes but everyone no. calls every single shoot them up a bullet hell and I hate it and it's I war okay? and I 
I was the one who warned Galen about maybe going a bit too hardcore on my commentary today. Jesus. <laughs> I'm just staying back and letting this one play out. Leave me out of it. I have no dog in this so, yes, dog fight. It is a shoot them up. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I also never played this game. I've never heard of it until you shared the the track. I gotta say, I didn't really enjoy the intro. It felt a bit too cheesy for my taste. But it gets really cool later on. It starts getting closer to a uh, thrash metal sound, and I really, really enjoy that. Um, I honestly, I, I, I guess I like it okay. It doesn't offend me, but, like, I can't really find anything that really draws me into the song. I've never been a big thrash guy to begin with. I do agree with the thrash assessment, so I think that's part of the issue, but, um... I guess I'm a fresh guy, then. Maybe. I don't know, it's not it's bad. Fine. I don't, don't want to sit here and pretend oh, yeah, it is, no, but it's also like... That, that's not how I took it, don't worry. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's just uh, some... Uh, uh, guitar rock. I wasn't kidding when I said the first part is just show enough, so... The fact that you find it cheesy, I'm entirely okay with. For the it record, it reminds me. It reminds me a lot of uh, people like uh, Ingwe Malmsteen. The the intro. Yeah, yeah, there's really a little bit of that. Melodies. Certainly, except you'd expect to find this more as a solo in the middle of a track rather than right in the opening of a remix. Even though this opening doesn't have anything to do with the track it's remixing. But, in a way, that's... Let's just say I respect the flex. Yeah, yeah, I can I can see that. There's something to be said about just, you know, here, have skill. Yeah, and without going full Dragon Force overboard uh, guitar soup. Oh, I know some people who are going to listen to this and hate your comment about Dragon Force, but I do 100% agree with you. Oh, same. I got stuck seeing them live. I have to say got stuck seeing them live because I got stuck seeing them live twice, opening for Camelot both times, and both times <laughs> they just bored me to tears. They're like the most successful piss-off-your-parents metal band in history. Like, they just exist to be extreme with actually no real love for music. They do it at least, at least seem to be pretty cool guys, so <clears throat> I have nothing against the people, but the music is oh, just... Oh, hard disagree. Herman Lee is a jerk. Really? Oh, yeah. No, he uh, he's like the worst kind of womanizer. I had a friend of mine who got hit on pretty hard by him, and I'm still kind of pissed at him for it. Okay, my opinion has changed. But yeah, basically... Uh... The, the way I see it is that they exist to have a maximum difficulty track in a Guitar Hero game. Pretty much. Pretty and much. And, some, the ones and the as far as rhythm pop games pop. go, I I don't generally go nor enjoy the maximum difficulty tracks. I like, like two-thirds of the difficulty is good. <laughs> and that translates to a certain pace and a certain musicality. Which I think is pretty much the point where most of the track we're talking about land. Yeah, I I prefer not injuring my wrists as I play Guitar Hero 2. Acceptable. Solid choice. Now then, since I don't really have much to talk about in relation to the game the track is from, besides the Genesis kind of song, tune and color, uh, let's move on to some Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, let's talk about one of the most famous rock tracks in the history of game music. Um, I felt Just it, that. Yeah. I felt it would be kind of remiss of me not to bring this song up. Um, just because if we're talking about rock music in games, there's one opening riff that has pretty much gotten me every time from the very first time I heard it all the way back in the far-off land of 1997. Um, yeah, that one. 
I, I want a full album of just Ranakel doing a guitar riffs with his mouth. <laughs> I'll be my own week. I, I I could record that. I we we could do that. Sell that as merch. Ranakel's uh, beatbox covers of like all this crap. Um, I'm invested and have no respect for my throat. Just please sell it as Music Ar Arcade Presents so I earn a bit of money from it. Oh, yeah, actually, no, no, of course it would go to all of us. Actually, that's the good a good title for the album. I'm invested and I have no respect for my throat. <laughs> <coughs> um, anyway, yeah, this song is amazing, question mark? I don't really know what else to call it. This is one of Uematsu's greats, uh, and in fact, uh, there's a whole long story about this one, but the short version is, we, we talked about the FF7 Remake soundtrack in our opening episode, and when I first played the demo, we got to the first boss, and it played a fully orchestral version of this song, and I was just like, no, how dare you, this doesn't sound right. Um... Later on, we get to the airburst or the actual guitar riff plays, and I actually let out a yes because it let me know the song was actually in the game. Um, yeah, no, it's it's it. It's hard for me to say anything new and interesting about "Let Us Fight Further" because, frankly, "Let Us Fight Further" is just sort of omnipresent. It is one of those songs that fans of the game know, and a lot of people who even aren't fans of the game probably have heard. It's FF7 is, is the J JRPG, and uh, Those Who Fight Forever is the boss song. Pretty much. Um, at least in terms you of... Pick the Black Mage's cover of it. Why is yeah, that? Uh, live instruments, really. The fact that it has this incredible guitar solo in the middle, and the fact that it's kind of like the best version of itself. Uematsu, uh, Nobuo Uematsu himself, is the head of the Black Mage's was they yep. changed their name and started doing original music since then um and one of his first choices on his first album was a cover of this incredibly beefy incredibly famous and incredibly rock and song played by an actual rock band and there's something about it when put full together just clicks uh ff7 original version was always limited by the fact that it was still on PlayStation 1 and still the vast majority of instruments were MIDI. We hadn't even gotten to One-Winged Angel yet. That was at the end of that game where sampling first started to become a thing. Um, so to actually hear it played in its logical conclusion, in its final form of itself, so to speak, is really kind of special. Realized. To be fully realized. There you go. Thank you. That's what I was trying to say. It's really something special for someone who's a fan. Um, regardless yeah, of mean, that, the composition of it is incredibly strong. I've uh, seen uh, Alex Mukala do a uh, couple of tweet series, essentially, which is, I swear this track sounded like this in my head, which takes uh, PlayStation era music tracks and he remakes them fully orchestral, super grand grandiose and the likes and I'd say there is an argument that this version of those who write further is how it sounds in your head after you've listened to the in-game versions and let it sit there for a while I gotta be honest with you that is a fairly accurate statement because I did go back and listen to the original FF7 version not too long ago and it is I mean, again, m melodically, it's still amazing. It's still hook after hook after yeah. hook. It still gets in your head, but, like, obviously... Um, it does the best with the system's limitations. It does. It does. And the 32-bit era was always this incredibly transitional point, and that's true of graphics, music, gameplay. Um, so it, it doesn't live up as hard, but not, not by any fault of its own. Yeah. It's a product of uh, its time. And... Don't get me wrong, they were very much trained to flex. The main battle theme, the normal one, not this track, mm -hmm. uh, paying attention to it more recently, the amount of layers upon layers that make this track uh, is very much saying this is what we can do now. Yeah, we don't have just... I'm not sure how many layers the Super Nintendo had, either 8 or 16. Exactly. Um... 
we can do shred yeah. shredding cool bus themes now. It, it, it amazes me how much of FF7 soundtrack was really, we just talked about this, Uematsu just showing off. Yeah. Um, and really kind of pushing the music of that system kind of to its early limit, which is kind of perfect for it? Yeah. I, I like that it doesn't come off as him showing off how good he is. It's more that he's showing off how good the system allows him to be now. Yeah. Uh, so yes. it doesn't have an egocentric uh, feel that you usually get from when we refer to something as being show off. Yes, I, 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 you're absolutely correct, and I should have clarified that earlier. Thank you. And I should note, I don't play Final Fantasy, and Final Fantasy VII I tried to get into, but I really, really can't. The turn-based combat doesn't doesn't mesh well with me. But by God, I love this song as well. I mean, it's 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 hard to argue with the soundtrack. Uh, again, going back to our first episode of the show, um, I called Final Fantasy VII the best soundtrack of 1997. Not 2020, but 1997. We I did. have a real hard time, like, even finding, like any real competition for it. It is just so universally good. Yeah. It's a trip, and uh, yeah. us films uh, is yeah. the landmarks of this trip, the high points. It really is. You hear that guitar riff kick in, even if it's even in its old MIDI glory, like, yeah, you know something crazy's going on. Like a flame maker that uh, gets deliberately pincered attacked in order to get some interesting mechanics in. Man, that fight was so much so much crazier in Remake. But the yes. The track is so much crazier in Remake as well. It is. That that track is... Yeah, I've talked about her burst before, but yeah, that yeah, one kind of... It's the track that made me think that FF7 remake was in several respects about FF7. Yeah, I'm I will not respond to that for fear of spoilers, but yes, that is a fairly accurate assessment. Yes. God, now I'm thinking about that expansion that they just announced for PS5 starring Yuffie, and I'm like, I really want to play this. The Mughal Poncho is the best. Uh Anyway, I don't know what else I could have to say about FF7 at this point, so let's go ahead and kick it off to one last track. Rana, take it away. Uh, let's get away from this episode in a blaze of glory. We've seen this theme. So, Cinder. Do you, Galen, do you have a, a library of uh, free stock sound effects? Because I think we need a rim shot after that one. I. Uh, yeah, I do. I can just... Yes. I can see about that. <laughs> Rim shots are implied whenever I speak. Thank you very much. They really are. I kind of don't think we need it. This is this is the laugh track argument of, like, how many comedy shows really need a laugh track? This is where you laugh! Yeah, we, we, we don't need that. Let's just <laughs> let Rana have this one. Move on. Now then, uh, Cinder's theme originally uh, was along with a stage of course you couldn't select the the stage and the track uh, separately and sound design is a very deliberate part of killer instinct uh, in particular they made sure for the arcade original version uh, to have some sound effects way higher than the rest of the soundtracks so arcade owners were tricked into uh, Look, uh, setting the arcade cabinet sound at a higher level so that when the real loud sounds like the combo breakers and the like popped out everybody in the arcade cabinet would hear it that's yeah. a music arcade fact uh, so two point puns being in they... one, two puns in one topic that's that's a new record for you no, it's not. Uh, thank you. Uh, a, a music arcade <laughs> fact. The point is that uh, the no, it's not a record. Random puns all the time. Anyway, go on. Sorry. 
the point is that the sound design for Killer Instinct is something that's very far out, uh, even on the original version. And uh, yeah, that level of cinders is essentially this oil wig that is on fire. And fire is metal. That's just a fact of life. So there's I find, this... I find yeah? it a bit funny that it's uh, an oil rig on fire because the Super Nintendo version of that theme really reminds me of the uh, factories in uh, Donkey Kong Country 3 where there's a lot of uh, vets with molten metal uh, yeah, throughout the stages. That gives makes a similar sense. vibe to me. It's still got this industry air, uh, there's the rusted supports and everything that have common imagery and common instrumentations. It Whereas is by the same devs after all. Me, I'm like one of the earliest like tracks that could lead towards metal to me has always been fire by the crazy word of uh, the crazy world of Arthur Brown. Um, God, I love that track. Isn't it good? It's like this OG psychedelic rock, but it leans into the metal thing, and a lot of that is just this dude screaming fire a lot. And it manages to be a psych rock track without guitars. The main instrument is an organ. Yeah. Well, the guitar is still in there. It's just, it's very, it's not p super present. But yeah, no, it's it's a proto-metal track. And yeah, you were saying fire is metal. Then again, on the other yeah. hand, you have Adele and Alicia Keys both have songs just also basically talking about fire a lot and i'm just like mm, they're just flat out pop they're, they're i don't know what they're to, doing with this to paraphrase uh todd in the shadows he once said that uh, musicians have learned that simply screaming the word fire really gets people's attention in that song so it, it was bound to show up in pop music as well it was it was um yeah so yeah you you get some fire in this original track already, then you let it macerate for about two decades, and you add Mick Gordon to the mix. Boy, howdy, this version of this song is good. Yes, I actually this version of this song is how I was introduced to this version of Kiddo Instinct. I didn't really pay attention to the game. I noticed it, its launch uh, in the Microsoft conference, but I thought, yeah, it's Killer Instinct, sure, why not? It's got Combo Breaker, ha ha ha, Combo Breaker is memed out, whatever. Then I heard that track, I believe it was on the pre-show for, for an episode of the Corruptional Podcast, and I was like, what? is that I love it. And part of it was probably some half-forgotten familiarity with this track from playing the original Killer Instinct, and the rest is just how hard it shreds. It goes... Uh, it doubles down on the fire imagery with some of the instrumentation, giving this real feel of a uh, turned-on afterburner, and then there's the way it escalates throughout the phases because that's the uh, essentially the Mick Gordon sanctioned mix even though in-game you will never hear it this exact way because um, basically the original Killer Instinct had a main version of the track and a, a different pa part of the theme uh, used for when uh, a character was at low life and uh, then there's the way Killer Instinct does the music which could warrant uh, half an episode by itself where it plays off the way the fight ebbs and flows uh, interrupting and posing itself for the combo breakers uh, uh, changing subtly uh, from one round to the next and so it sounds like he just had fun with that Think, taking the main theme as the anchor and then going faster and faster uh, adding some variations it just really works really hard it's and like going, going fire to fire. Yeah, I think uh, going back to something we've brought up 
with other songs today as well about how they fit the gameplay the idea that this version of the track is so much faster than the original really fits how much faster this game is than the original killer instinct true uh, true which is funny because i remember will... playing the original killer instinct and it was very fast for its time yeah i was about to say that you would think that the game that introduced introduced the idea of an ultra combo to fighting games would be the fastest but the remake or reboot if you want to call, uh, call it that way is even faster and it's it doesn't have those uh, mechanics i've mentioned at the top of the show where uh, anime fighters have with dashes and air dashes and teleports and whatnot well, except but that the movement does too very specifically fast. does yeah, is I the, mean, one in the game with air dashes as his gimmicks but in, in general, it's not a game that has those those things. Uh, Killer Instinct usually is more or less Mortal Kombat on steroids. It's not an anime fighter, but it has the speed of an anime fighter still, despite those mechanics of dashes and whatnot uh, not being as widespread uh, across its characters. I'd say the game's main defining characteristic as far as his n its niche inside the fighting game genre is is how both players are always active even when one of the players is getting comboed because of the combo breaker systems. Yeah. Um, fun fact, Cinder was the only character in the Super Nintendo version I could actually pull off a, a high-string combo with. He was it. Oh, yeah, same. Uh, and I can't combo in a fighting game in my life. That, uh, yeah. Mick Gordon doing Mick Gordon things. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to argue with Mick Gordon doing Mick Gordon things. This was pre Doom, I think, wasn't it? Uh. Yes. Yeah. If your instinct was 2013 or 2014, Dune was 2016. I, I wish Killer Instinct got more recognition just as a whole, both as a Hashtag fighting Green game Day series Day. and for its music. Like, I, I think there's one service we're doing. It's like, yeah, go listen to the soundtrack. It's great. Yes. Shout out to Maximilian. If you think Mick Gordon is a one trick pony, you haven't listened to that OST. I'm going to be honest, he may still be a one-trick pony, it's just that that one trick is really, 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 really good. I disagree with him being a one-trick pony, because Killer Instinct also has the most... Uh, going back to gothic things again, uh, it has uh, one theme song for a... I forget the name, the werewolf uh, character. Saberwolf. Uh, Thank you. Saberwolf. And... His theme is the most ambiance-heavy gothic uh, track in a game I've ever heard. It's really, really good. And, and it's then, not rock, it's not metal, it's just orchestral. And then they go one step further in being both uh, heavy metal and horror with his Hisako's theme. I mean, Saber Wolf uh, is a track, his track is one where you can headbang to a classical track, essentially. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and then you play TJ Combo and you have a rap song with some elements of his original, more funky tracks in inserted in a more angry... Uh, we're getting distracted than talking about the entirety of the Chaos soundtrack, aren't we? Well, the entirety of the first two seasons of the soundtrack, anyway. Let's not talk about season three. Not that not they did an inherited bad job, but it was different. I don't like the artist they chose for season three. Not the a music. Fan? Not really, no. As is your right as a human being. Nothing. Uh that's Pretty much all I have to say on this track. Shall we wrap it up? Yeah. Um, just to clarify, it's pretty evident that all three of us are pretty big rock fans, just sort of in general. 
Yeah. There was a lot of cuts for a lot of potential tracks. Oh, for there this. were. If you are a rock or metal fan and your favorite tracks wasn't discussed, don't worry. Some of our favorite tracks weren't discussed as well. Yeah, and there's enough material for this particular topic to come back to multiple specials of this because rock is a pretty common refrain in these, in these games. Maybe so. I'll talk about F Zero this time. Boy, that would be awesome. I I, I feel scared if we end up going to racing games because I'm not going to have any idea what to talk about. Yeah. <sighs> well, you're not alone on that one. There are some hidden gems. There really are. Um, that is all the time we have for today. Now we need to go lay down a bit. This headbanging is making us dizzy. See you next time, guys.